Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming to Peace of Art, mobilizing art for justice on the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. My name is Lourdes Gutierrez Najera, and I'm an assistant professor of anthropology and Latin American, Latino, and Caribbean studies. <clears throat> Before I introduce myself, I would like to thank our sponsors, including the Latin American, Latino, and Caribbean Studies Program, the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center for Public Policy and Social Sciences, the Bildner Program, Dartmouth Women in Business, the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding, the Leslie Center for the Humanities, the William Jewett Tucker Foundation, and Dartmouth Women's and Gender Studies. Many of us have heard about the recent waves of violence along the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. As you might also be aware, much of the drug-related violence is occurring in Ciudad Juarez, across from El Paso, Texas. In December 2010, the BBC reported that more than 3,000 drug-related deaths had occurred that year, 10 times, that, 10 times the figure recorded in 2007. More than 30,000 people have died across uh, Mexico since have died across Mexico since President Felipe Calderón launched an offensive against the drug cartels in 2006. The city of Juarez is now said to be the most violent city in the world. Having roots in, and family in Ciudad Juarez, I became especially concerned by the increasingly undiscriminating nature of the violence, cutting across gender, class, and racial divides. Certainly, the state of violence have, has left many people wondering what we ought to and can do in response. Sandra Salas, a graphic designer with a BA in graphic design and mass media advertising from the University of Texas El Paso, offers an example of one local movement that was created to raise awareness and protest the violence in Ciudad Juarez. In 2010, Sandra co-founded the Piece of Art Project and poster exhibit part of which is on display in the very corridor of our library this week. The exhibition, Piece of Art, focuses on educating individuals and communities about the situation of violence in the borderland and, uh, and raising funds to help the victims uh, of that violence. I would like to encourage you to walk through the exhibit this week. The Piece of Art poster exhibit ends Friday, April 22nd. Today, Sandra is here to speak about the piece of art's response to ongoing events in Ciudad Juarez. Please help me welcome Sandra Salas. Hi, y'all. I'm from Texas. <laughs> um, well, first, I want to thank you all for being here um, and lending an ear. And I'd especially like to thank the Rockefeller Center, of course, and the uh, the long one, Latin American, Latino, and Caribbean Studies programs for inviting me. And a special thanks to Sarah Morgan and Lourdes Gutierrez Najera for making all the arrangements for us to come and show the exhibit and make this talk possible. So I'm going to show you a video. Ciudad Juarez, also known as Mexico's City of Death. While attempting to curtail mostly drug-related violence, the city still reports to have the highest murder rate in the world. Government corruption, drug violence, and poverty have led to the dispirited and disorderly atmosphere that now permeates the city.
and the shooting extended beyond that busy intersection here in South Juarez. One innocent bystander was actually hit by a bullet in the foot. She was working at this quesadilla stand. Thousands of wounded innocent people swamp local hospitals. And many children are now orphans due to the violence. January 30th, 2010, Erika and her husband were victims of the massacre in Villas de Salvarcar, where 16 adults and teenagers were killed. Some neighbors came running to help. All of them died. She woke up in the hospital, a widow, the victim of three gunshot wounds, and a witness to one of the latest senseless acts of violence in the city of Juarez. She was hospitalized for almost two months, she must attend physical therapy sessions every day to recover from what the violence in Juarez has taken from her. Her memory, her ability to speak, and the ability to move her right limbs. The one thing she will never recover again is her one true love, Eduardo. Erica and her family are just one of the casualties of this violence in Juarez. While the government has declared war on the cartels, it's the citizens who suffer the most. They are the ones who are left with focusing on keeping their children safe and working hard at their low-paying jobs as they dream of a better future for their families. Many families like Erica's live on little to no money and rely on churches and charities to feed their families and to care for the ill and wounded. As the death toll in Juarez rises, artists in El Paso and Juarez are banding together to raise awareness and help victims of the violence. Now it's very like a ghost town, like there's nothing, there's the kids are not playing anymore on the streets. Right now, I don't think uh, we're going in the right way, but this kind of things will help us achieve that. We would all get together as one big family. We have 45 graphic designers from El Paso doing posters to promote peace in the region or to protest the violence to El Juarez. And then we have about 50 posters from designers in Juarez, in the University of Juarez. I hope that all of us keep this our little piece of, of hope and prayer for everybody to start thinking about what we can do. Now you can make a difference in the lives of those who have been affected by the violence in Juarez. For more information on how you can get involved, visit peaceofartshow.org. Um. This is what's going on right now in Sierra Juarez, but I would like to tell you a little bit more about, um, about the history of Sierra Juarez. I, I want you guys to understand a little bit more on how Paso and Sierra Juarez are so close. So um, Sierra Juarez was uh, a town founded in 1659 by uh, Spanish missionaries. Um, the city was formerly known as Paso del Norte and it's located along the Rio Grande. Um, it was part of New Spain, later Mexico. And then um, in 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, established the Rio Grande as the border between the US and Mexico. And so El Paso had already been there before, and there were people living on the north side of the, border, of the river and people living on the south side. 
the people living on the north side uh, became U.S. citizens. I guess they were the first immigrants. Um, and so two cities were formed, El Paso on the northern side of the river and Ciudad Juarez on the southern part of, of, of the river. And so um, today, El Paso and Ciudad Juarez uh, is the largest binational metropolitan area in the world. We have two million people living in that area. Uh, the locals refer to that region as obviously the borderland. Um, Ciudad Juarez has, well, had a population of 1.3 million, and El Paso had a population of 650,000. Uh, there are four ports of entry. Uh, Ciudad Juarez is the major port of trade and traffic from all of central and northern Mexico into the U.S. Uh, there's two railroad companies uh, that cross through the region, one from north to south and the other one from east to west. Um, there's over 300 maquiladoras or factories in uh, Ciudad Juarez. The economies depend on each other. 50,000 50,000 jobs in El Paso are tied to Mexico. Annually, approximately 23 million people cross the border through the El Paso and Ciudad Juarez entry ports. Mexican nationals come annually to El Paso for shopping reasons, and that creates about 3,800 retail jobs alone in El Paso. About 70 Fortune 500 companies have facilities in El Paso uh, because of its relationship with Ciudad Juarez. Um, $71 billion in trade across the border in 2010 alone. So um, these two cities that once were one city became divided, but they've, uh, there's, they, they've always shared a culture, and they've always seen each other as sister cities. But it wasn't until 2007 that they actually made it official, and they actually signed a sister city agreement. So we're officially sister cities, even though that was always the case. Um, so whatever happens in either side of the border, whether it's uh, social, economic, environmental, political, and even spiritual, it affects the other side. And so I, I wanted you to understand how close these two cities are. So because of the importance logistically and geographically of this particular borderland, um, the cartels obviously want access to it. Um, there are four major cartels right now in Mexico, the Tijuana cartel, the Gulf cartel, the Sinaloa cartel, and obviously the Juarez cartel. And because of the importance in Ciudad Juarez, of Ciudad Juarez, the Sinaloa cartel wants this particular route, and that's how, that's how the violence started. Like Lourdes had mentioned, in 2006, Presidente Felipe Calderón takes office and declares a war on cartels. He makes it difficult for them, so they start fighting the territory, you know? And so the violence was between, um, it was between the cartels and the police. So there was so much violence that in 2008, Felipe Calderón decides to sell the, send the federal police to take, to make order, you know? And that didn't happen, so then he sent the military. And the only thing that caused that was uh, for the violence to rise. So in 2008, there were 1,600 deaths. In 2009, there were 2,600 deaths. In 2010, there were 3,000 deaths. 2011, we, we still don't know, but it's pretty, pretty bad. Now the cartels are kind of desperate because the government declared the war on them. So they need to uh, raise money, and so they started extorting businesses in Mexico. And of all the businesses that they extort, it is estimated that about 50% of these businesses complied with the cartel's demands. So that's kind of scary, you know? Since 2008, over 10,000 businesses have closed. 40 to 60,000 maquila workers have lost their jobs. Unemployment has risen to 20%. So uh, over, they say about 45% of the population in Ciudad Juarez is under the age of 25 because they were maquila workers. And so um, now they're unemployed. And so they be, they're, they're prey for the cartels. They are recruited by the cartels. They make good money. So now an everyday person becomes a criminal overnight. You know, It is estimated that um, 300,000 or somewhere between 300,000 and 500,000 people have left the city 
And of those, about 100,000 have actually migrated to El Paso. And some of them have done it legally, and some of them have done it illegally. Um, so we really don't know how many people have officially crossed. Um, on the con and so because of all of that, the city has become the most violent city you know, in the world. On the other hand, El Paso being so close to it was declared second safest city in the country in 2010. And we were the all-American city in 2010. So it's kind of weird that a few miles away from each other, well, not even, I mean a few feet away from each other, there's like the most violent city in the world and then one of the safest city in the country. And the reason why El Paso is safe is because we have a lot of government agencies. We have the local police, we have the county sheriff, we have the DEA there, we have the FBI, ICE, Border Patrol, the National Guard, and we have Fort Bliss, which is one of the largest military uh, forts in the country. And so cartels know they don't, they don't want to mess with people in El Paso. Um, so, that's, um, so as you can see, the people in Ciudad Juarez, they have it hard. I mean, the people who had money and are able to move out, they're already gone. But we're talking about the poor. We're talking about the people who can't move, they don't have the resources, and like Lourdes said, the violence is all over the country anyways. So, you know, wherever they go in Mexico, it's, it, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna be it. So there's a big migration to the United States. Um, and so that is affecting us, and, or at least it will affect us. Um, something that um, Juarenses have to deal with, I mean, they're stuck there. You know, they must get up and go to work every day. They must take their children to school and hope that, you know, everything is gonna be okay by the end of the day. They take a day at a time. They must continue with their lives, you know? So they have no choice, you know? People live with fear. They actually live with guilt because they feel partly responsible for for the violence because there was a there was a lot of corruption in the city and every Juarense was part of it. And so they feel like they contributed to, to this, that it snowballed into this and they feel responsible for it. And they also feel powerless and they feel helpless. So they really don't know what to do. They don't know who the enemy is. They don't know who to go for help, the government, the cartels, they're confused. And so they just deal with it. But throughout history, there's always a group of people who are willing to step up, you know, and do something. And it's usually artists. Not, not to make myself look good, but it's usually <laughs> artists. You know, and so um, there are a lot of um, human rights organizations and artist groups in Ciudad Juarez who are actually standing up and doing much. In El Paso, it's a little bit slower. People, you know, mm, but it is happening. So I'm gonna show you um, I'm going to show you a video where you can see kind of like the feeling, what, what, what these groups are doing. Uh, they're doing marches, they're doing protests. <laughs> Poets, musicians, writers, artists, they're all coming together and speaking out against the
que esta lucha dará paso firme cuando la lucha laboral, sindical, la del campo, por la tierra, la lucha por la educación, por los derechos humanos, la lucha por los derechos de las mujeres, por las autonomías, la lucha indígena, la lucha de los migrantes, todas las luchas se unan a compromiso de lucha. Jóvenes contra la militarización y la violencia, saludamos la trinchera de esperanza que es Ciudad Juárez, hermanando nuestra lucha con la suya, que es la misma. No están solos, basta los femicidios y feminicidios, basta la militarización en Ciudad Juárez, basta la militarización en el país, basta a la guerra, ya basta. Coordinadora Metropolitana contra la Militarización y la Violencia, 29 de enero del 2011, Ciudad Juárez. So, as you can see, there is passion. Um, people do want to help. People are standing up and raising their voices for those who can't be heard. Um, and so there is a movement on both sides of the border. Um, some of the things that the people were, were saying, was, one of them was a poet reading this, you know, poem about the sisterhood between the cities. Uh, the other lady was saying, you know, that we need to, we need to, ya basta means enough is enough, you know. We need to do something to help these people. And so, um, as you can see, there is a movement in the arts and in the human rights organizations. And I'm here to talk about one in particular which is piece of art designed for change. So I'm going to tell you a little bit. The, the video that I showed at the very beginning where it talks about the massacre of Villa de Salvarcar, um, that, um, that um, I'm sorry, uh, that event, uh, I'm a graphic designer. I'm not an academic, just some girl who likes to draw, you know? And so um, I rem I grew up in Ciudad Juarez. I'm a U.S. citizen, but my family is from Mexico, and I grew up in Ciudad Juarez. And so I'm living here in the States, have my business, blah, 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 blah. I'm happy. And um, January 30th of 2010, that massacre occurred. And I remember I was watching the news with a couple of my friends, and we were going to go party afterwards. And we saw the news clip, and we made a pause. And then we kind of went, oh, I poor Mexicans, you know, it's their problem, and we went about our business. And so I remember we went partying, and, and I was just so upset at myself. I was just so angry that, that I reacted like that, that I didn't care enough. You know, I made a pause and went about my business, you know? You, I mean, my family lives there, my cousins, my uncles, my grandparents, my parents were living there at the time, 
and I didn't care. And so I thought, if somebody like myself, who grew up there, you know, doesn't care, then what could I expect of any other person, right? And so, because of the closeness of Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, you would assume that people there care, but we obviously didn't. And so that really bothered me. And so I decided to create a sketch of a poster, like kind of like a, a satire. And it was like in the style of like James Bond movie poster. And, and I called it Ciudad Juarez, License to Kill. And I would show it to uh, a lot of my colleagues. And um, I would notice that it, it would spark con uh, conversation about the subject, you know? Most people didn't want to hear about the violence. It was happening to the Mexicans. It is not our problem. But when I would show that poster, people would start talking about it. And so that's when I started inviting them. I said, you know what? Can you design a poster that protests the violence in Ciudad Juarez or that promotes peace in the region? And before I knew it, I had 50 graphic designers committed to design a poster. And so I was like, OK, we'll see if it happens. Well, it happened. And then at the same time, the University of Ciudad Juarez, the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juarez, was doing a similar call for entries. And we, they heard about us. We heard about them. We got together, and we joined the posters. So half of the posters are done by graphic designers in Mexico, and half of them are done by graphic designers in the States. But one of the criteria was that the designers who participated needed to have roots in the borderland, because I wanted to see what they thought about it. They grew up there. They lived there. Many of them lived in New York, LA, Austin, but they all had roots in the borderland. They all had family, went to school or something. So I wanted to see their perspective. And so before we knew it, we had 90 posters. And then we were like, oh, so what are we going to do? And we were like, OK, well, I called Richard. And because um, I'm just like woof, woof, dreamer. And so I needed a person who can help me um, actually make things happen. And so um, we got together. We decided to do a show, a one night show. That was it. And um, we were very shocked to find out that the community in El Paso supported the exhibit, the project, like 100%. Because the place that where we had the show, it was, everything was very grassroots. The place was like one of my client's retail, empty retail space. Um, and he actually painted it and restored it just for us. Um, the company that Richard works for, they sponsored some of the uh, TV spots. We got invited to come to the morning shows, the noon shows, different radio stations, different television stations. The newspapers wrote stories about it. I mean, the entire community was very pro piece of art. And opening night, we, sh we had about, what, 600 people show up. And that's really great for El Paso, because El Pasoans are not art lovers. And so and we were shocked, because we were like, I mean, we were opening doors at 6, and people were showing up at 5. And so it, it was very, very interesting. We had a children's choir participate. And also, we had the professional graphic designers doing posters, but we also went to different elementary schools. And we asked second graders to depict peace. I asked them, I want you to tell me what peace is to you and draw it. A couple of weeks later, I went back, picked up the artwork. Um, I'm sure you've seen some of, the, some of the drawings from the kids. Second graders were showing the violence in Ciudad Juarez and the peace in El Paso. And I was very shocked because I was thinking, how can the second grader understand and be aware of what's going on in their community? And most of us adults want to look the other way. And so that was, that was like a, an eye-opener for me. And so anyways, like I said, the community responded. The media is still help. I mean, the entire community is still behind us. Uh, opening night happened. And before we know it, people started inviting us to come and show the artwork. So, we've been, so we actually took the artwork to UTEP, the University of Texas at El Paso. We did a forum. Um, we went to the Chamizal National Memorial Park invited by a government agency. We went to Chuck the Block, which is like a city of El Paso Arts Department. We worked with a, with a group called Mujeres de la Tierra, which is a, a women's artist group. Um, we went to La Parada, which is a group of local artists and activists. 
And so they all wanted to, they all wanted to raise money for piece of art because even though the goal for the exhibit was to raise awareness about the situation of violence, we also wanted to help people. And so we opened, we didn't know how to do it. And so we opened up a fund called the Peace of Art Fund. We're not a non-for-profit organization yet, but if we affiliate ourselves with a foundation that is already doing work on both sides of the border, then we could, you know, they could be our fiscal partners. So we opened up a fund through them, through the Frontera Women's Foundation, found an organization in Ciudad Juarez, Pastoral Obrera, and so the idea is to help out victims, raise enough funds so that we can help victims of the violence in Ciudad Juarez. And when I say victims, I'm not talking cartel people killing each other, because now anybody can become a victim, um, you know, directly or indirectly. You know, a lot of people have, I mean, I had a friend who was a sicario, a hitman, and I didn't even know he was a hitman until I invited him to the exhibit and he said no. <laughs> and um, so, you know, that um, we all have friends who use drugs. And if you use drugs and you're buying or distributing or selling or whatever, you, somehow you're related to the cartels. Because remember, there's unemployment. Remember all the stuff I already said. So you don't know if your neighbor is somehow related you know, to the cartels, so you could be having dinner with him at his house and somebody can come and shoot you because you happen to be with him, you know? Um, there's a lot of orphans because, you know, a lot of people are being killed. Um, so what are we gonna do with them? There's a lot of businesses who are being extortioned, like I said earlier, and if they can't meet, you know, the quotas, then their businesses get burned, you know, and suddenly they're, they don't have anything. And so these are the kind of people that we're trying to help with our fund. Um, we've been very successful at raising awareness. We haven't, been very, we haven't been very successful in raising funds, but I think eventually we'll get there. Um, we've also been invited to go to different cities. So we've been in Las Cruces, New Mexico, in Tucson, Arizona, Austin, Texas, Oberlin, Ohio, obviously Ciudad Juarez, Tijuana, Aguascalientes, San Luis Potosí in Mexico, Mexico City among other cities, and of course now Hanover, New Hampshire. Um, so I wanna show you a couple of the videos of how, um, where we've been, you know, I do, and those videos, I edit them myself, so, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a video person, but I, it, it's all grassroots. Um, and so I wanna show you some of the, some of the videos of like when we go and we, everything is very grassroots. Um, and little by little, you know, people are becoming interested in, in this project. And every time, we sh every time we do a showing, we always meet very interesting people who want to do something. And they come to us and they say, what, how can I help you? I mean, we already got people like our U.S. Uh, representatives of Vesta Reyes contacting us and saying, I love your project. What, what can I do? How can I help you? And everywhere we go, the media is always there, so we, we have a strong support from the media. Now, while you guys are watching that, in Ciudad Juarez, the response has been different. The media doesn't want to hear about it. We've contacted them many times. They don't care about it. But on the other hand, Juarez, people from Ciudad Juarez who have heard about the exhibit, contact us. Some of them cross the border to come and see it. They contact us. They tell us, man, it is so awesome to know that there's people out there outside of Ciudad Juarez who actually cares. Will you solve the violence? Maybe, maybe not. Will the cartels, you know, leave because of your exhibit? Probably not. But at least we know that somebody's out there, like I said earlier, raising 
awareness about the situation because they don't want to be ignored. You know, they want the world to know what's going on, and um, it's 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 just it's just a really bad situation. And so, I want to show you another video. I check the block. Go to Dharma. This is another event um, that we were at. And like I said, it's just Richard and I. You're going to see us in every video. And so, um, and like an event like that, that was downtown El Paso. We were there for an art festival. Um, how many people went to that? They say that, what is how many? About 5,000 people showed up. Um, and it was like a two day event. And it seems like there's like very, you, we never had like hundreds of people looking at it, but there was constant flow. And we had people from the Border Patrol, from, from different government agencies coming up to us and telling us their views on the situation. And, you know, just a lot of very interesting, um, a lot of very interesting things happening. Every time we show the exhibit, we meet great people who want to do something, and, and it's just amazing to know that people do care. Um, like I said, um, where are we now? We're trying to show the exhibit everywhere we go. Um, but we're also working on the volume two. Um, because we do have a website, peaceofartshow.org, art, piece check it out. And we're also on Facebook. Um, we have about 980 some followers on Facebook right now. And many of them are not even from the States or Mexico. Many of them are from, most of them are graphic designers or artists or, you know, who um, live in areas of conflict, areas where there's also violence. And so they feel like they have to support, you know, a movement like this or a project like this because they're going through the same thing. And so this, we're, we're working on volume two and we're gonna do the call for entries in a couple of weeks and we're gonna open it worldwide and we're gonna call it Perspectives because we wanna see how, how the world views the situation of violence and bias and see what they can do or, or if there are any suggestions, you know. And so you guys are probably, you know, just thinking, so what? what why should I care? Why should I care what's happening in Ciudad Juarez in Mexico? Why should I care? And, you know, I've thought about it, and I've, I've always wondered, why should other people care? Because people think, you care too much. And I'm like, I think it's important for us to care because we are citizens of the world. We are, you know, we're in a global society. We all depend on each other. Uh, a country like ours is so blessed. I mean, we have, and it's our duty to be humanitarian so there. Yeah, we're in all these wars, yeah, you know, sometimes we screw up, but ultimately, we're probably the luckiest people in the world, and it's our duty to care for our neighbors. And th that's all I can say, you know, and hopefully you guys are gonna, I'm gonna plant a seed on you guys and, and, and hope that you guys at least care. And if I did get you to care, then there are things that you can do. And one of the things is learn about these injustices, educate yourself about them, <coughs> witness them, document them, raise awareness, raise your voice for those who can't do it for themselves, denounce it, don't look the other way, avoid being part of the problem. Think that every time, and some, some of you are gonna disagree with me on this one, but think that every time that you smoke a joint or use any form of illegal drugs, you are contributing to all the deaths and all the violence that is happening in the borderland. And so, you can also help by going to our website, going to our Facebook page, spreading the word, buying posters and t-shirts, making a donation if you like. But even if you don't care, let me show you another video. Even if, you don't, even if you don't care what's going on in Ciudad Juarez, I, I wanna make the invitation to you guys that whenever you see any form of social injustice, if it's next to you, if it's 
in your city, in the next city, in another country. Stop and think about your role in it. And please do not look the other way. And then if you can, take action. And you don't have to be Superman or Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. or Mother Teresa, you know, to do anything. We all have different <laughs> gifts and talents. I was a, I'm a graphic designer. He's a marketing direct, uh, expert. This is what we know, so we created art, you know? And then we branded it, and then we, you know. So this is what we do. But whatever you do, whether you're an artist, whether you're, I don't know, a scientist, whatever, whatever you do, I'm sure you have a talent, and I'm sure you can do something, you know, to, to, to try to solve any of the injustices that might be around you. And so I like to end it with a couple of words of Mother Teresa. Um, she said, if we have no peace, it's because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. Thank you. So I don't know if you guys have any questions. Yes. Hi, you mentioned something that the media in Ciudad Juarez did not really care. Can you give us some reasoning or shed some light as to why you think that they just don't care? I think a lot of it has to do with fear. <coughs> many of the many of the reporters, you know, have been kidnapped, killed. Um, anybody who speaks against the cartels or the government you know, can suddenly disappear. Um, so they're very cautious as to deciding what they want to promote or not and support. And then also one of the reasons is, and I was speaking to, to uh, a reporter from El Diario in Ciudad Juarez, and he was telling me, do you really want people to know that you're doing, you know, do you really want the cartels to know your name? You know, and I was like, like you know, I don't have a problem with them knowing, I mean, but they said, but do you have family, you know? Because they're not gonna come and get you, they're gonna come and get your family. And so when he said that to me, I realized, well, yeah, then he's not gonna run the story, you know? Because he's gonna put his name on it, and you know, you know, he's, he's already been threatened from what he told me, and so fear is a big part. Um, also, there is hearsay that some of the newspapers and TV stations in Ciudad Juarez are somehow related to the cartels. So you really don't know, you know, who they work for or what they stand for, but they I mean, overall I think it's fear. Yes. Many Mexican intellectuals and even former presidents like Cedillo and I believe Vicente Fo many uh, Mexican intellectuals, actually Latin American intellectuals. Mm -hmm. And I think even some former presidents, such as Cedillo and Vicente Fox, have stated that, that drugs should be legalized. I'm wondering what uh, the sense is among many, some of the graphic artists um, who participate there. I mean, there's one poster that says legalized, so I'm just wondering how that debate is going on among the art community, or those you know. How y'all doing? My name is Richard Luna. I am a marketer. Um, thank you all again for letting us be here. Um, to answer your question, I work with uh, the TV stations obviously on a regular basis. Um, the problem over there is that you know it, it's such a, um, a two-sided subject that it's difficult to say what would curtail some of these cartels essentially. Um, a lot of people talk about legalization and taking the criminal element out of it. Um, would you be the decision maker to do that or who is the decision maker to do that? Um, a lot of the reasons why the violence is happening in Juarez right now is because the law hasn't been respected in that sense. Um, and essentially it breaks down to even the smallest portion. Um, Sandra and I, because we do live there, we used to frequent Juarez on a regular basis, um, you know, to go eat, hang out, have some fun. Um, I live there. Yeah, yeah. And, and what it is is that you take $20 and you put it in your, your pocket or you save it because there are times when you'll get stopped by the Mexican police, the federales, and if you give them a 20, they'll let you go. So it's that lack of respect that starts from that very small portion of giving them a 20 that has, has basically increased the amount of lack of respect for the law. 
Um, and so even as far as saying, well, how come the Mexican government hasn't done as much as they can, or are they doing as much as they can? The corruption goes so far that nobody really knows who's in, who's out, um, and as a matter of fact, they let go a whole third of the force um, because they were corrupt, and they just joined the cartel. So in Mexico, it's difficult. Um, in the U.S., it's difficult. Um, a lot of the demand comes from the U.S., and so if that demand is not there, then what else would they do? Um, and it's easy to say that, yes, we can legalize drugs and we can make it so that it's, there's no more criminal element, but the thing about the cartels that a lot of people don't understand is that they are businessmen in their own right. Um, and if you're going to take away their supply of drugs, then they're going to go and take it from something else. Um, one example is um, last summer, they actually caught some or they saw some tunnels um, being dug between the U.S. and Mexico side. Um, some of those tunnels actually led to um, oil pipes. And the cartels are siphoning the oil from these pipes. So essentially, basically, they're, they're, the, the drug portion is a small portion, I think, of what they in a total aspect of the whole thing is what they're doing. Um, take it away from them and the cartels, I guarantee, will find another product to sell. Um, so with the legalization of drugs and everything else, I mean, it's difficult to say that would the cartel stop and would they um, no longer create that violence? I'm not sure. Anybody else? Would uh, instituting a death penalty and in, uh, institute some kind of fear into the drug cartels and maybe make members a little bit more hesitant to join them? Can you repeat the question? Um, would uh, instituting a death penalty in Mexico create a, institute a sense of fear into those members who are maybe on the borderline of joining cartel groups? Probably not because um, Many of these people who join, like I said earlier, <coughs> I'm going to make it personal. Like I said earlier, I had a friend who was a sicario, a, ki a hitman, a killer. He worked for a cartel. And when I found out, I asked him, I mean, we were friends. I loved this guy. He was my friend. And so when, when I actually sat with him and I said, why are you, at, why are you in this cartel? Why are you doing this? Um, he said, well, because I didn't have an education. I could be working. 12 hour, you know, jobs, hard work, hard labor, and probably make, you know, Minimum 30 range. bucks, you know? And so he says, this is easy money. You know, with this work, I was able to buy a house for my mom, for my sister. I have a good life. And I know that tomorrow I might be gone, and I'm okay with that. And so, sure enough, two months later, I saw his name in the news, I heard his name in the news, and sure enough, he, he was killed. And so death penalty, they know they're going to die. They know that the easy money is going to make them, they're living for now. They don't care about the future. They know they're going to, they know they're going to die. So death penalty probably wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't scare them. I, and that's my opinion. Is the basic motivation poverty or is it the cartels kill each other, but what is the motivation? Is it people are poor? Does the government of Mexico have some kind of welfare system? No. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> a lot of what the reasons for people joining the cartels is necessity. Um, one example is there's a, a few towns further south from uh, where we are at <laughs> where federales, <laughs> Mexican agents, will go down and ask questions of the, the total population they don't get any answers whatsoever because what's happened is the cartels have built an economic system in these towns and so they're building churches they're building businesses they're providing schools and they're actually funneling money into that city so imagine uh, kids without that education and and mothers who are struggling to even provide for their families when the cartel comes in and offers them this this money this easy way of providing for their family it's for them a, a no thought situation. Um, their families are living on rice and beans for the most part for the entire week where maybe they earn $5 a week. Well, the cartels are going in there and saying, listen, I'll give you $80 a day if you work for me, $100 a day. I'll give you $1,000 this week if you work for me. And for these people who are impoverished, it's difficult for them to say no. 
And so when the agents are going into these places and asking them who's a cartel member, who's one of the agents, you know, who, who's participating in this, their hands go up and they say, gosh, I really don't know. Because if you tell on them, essentially the money that you're getting to provide for your family gets lost and is gone. And so a lot of these people don't have that choice to say, yes, I will work for you. Or, or you know, essentially they just say, gosh, I, I really don't have a choice. And so a lot of it is out of necessity. A, a lot of the things that you have to think about too is that Mexico is not exactly, um, it, it's not like America where, you know, there is a tax system that's equal and just. Um, you know, a lot of the, the people, <laughs> yeah. well, I, I mean, I, it's a I matter of opinion, <laughs> yeah. Um, but essentially, you know, the government provides very little for these people. Um, you know, even, even, you know, a lot of the, the church groups that we've uh, worked with, um, they're on a regular basis providing food for these families' clothing because they can't afford all of this. Um, and, and if you guys get a chance, uh, please go to uh, El Paso City uh, Government website. Um, and the Ciudad Juarez website, and of course our website. But you can see the proximity of, of how close we are to one another. But in that sense also as well, you can see that, um, I don't know if, if all of you are, or if any of you are familiar with I-10. It's, it's a long stretch of highway that goes from, you know, roughly Louisiana down to California. Well, it passes through El Paso. Well, when you're driving through the I-10 going east or west, it's a matter of if I'm going, let's say, west, it's a matter of looking to my left, and I see the beautiful houses on the mountain of El Paso. I see all the light, uh, the, the beautiful buildings that we have on our side. But I look directly to my left, and I can see the worst and most impoverished area in Ciudad Juarez. And, and I'm talking about um, it's so impoverished that these houses are made of cardboard, um, pieces of wood that have been collected and put together so that they can have some sort of shelter. Um, these people are extremely in, in a poor situation and can't provide for themselves. So it's difficult for them to even continue without having to think about, well, gosh, do I, do I go this route and, and do I provide for my family? Um, a lot of them are taking that chance because, again, it's, it's, it's easy money. You know, I, we were talking to a class earlier today where I said, think about um, if you guys couldn't have cheeseburgers for two weeks, or you hadn't eaten for about five weeks, you know? Um, obviously, I'm, I'm sure medically that can happen, but if you were that starving and somebody said, I've got the biggest cheese pizza you could ever eat, or they say, I've got the best tofu you can imagine. <laughs> if you're hungry, that tofu sounds pretty good, if you're hungry. So the situation there for them, that's, that's the way they are. They're in dire straits, um, you know, and, it, and it's tough. It's difficult. Um, I've seen a lot of images of art that's actually on the border, like directly, a lot of graffiti stuff. So I don't actually know if it's legal to put art up on the border, no? no. Okay, so I was gonna ask if you guys thought it was most effective to sort of use it as a form of dialogue with people uh, that are immediately there, or is the intent more to reach people who aren't so, I mean, it sounds like people in El Paso aren't even totally aware of what's going on, but people who, like us here, who are, feels, seem so disconnected but really are connected in other ways. Is it more important, do you think, to use art as a form of dialogue directly, right? in the situation, or is, is my question making sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or to raise awareness kind of I, th I think you scale. hit it on the nose. Um, we feel as artists um, throughout history have that power and have that uh, ability to be able to say something and people will listen. Uh, because I mean, I'm sure all of us have a favorite artist of some sorts, whether that's architect, whether it's a writer, um, whether it's a painter. Um, these, these different styles of artistry, they speak to us. And so what we've created here uh, is essentially that that uh, middle ground between the boundaries that, that people have. So just like the people in El Paso who are slightly oblivious to, or at least turning a, a different way, um, it's more difficult to say, come over here, where most of the information that's from Juarez or, or the news that's happening over there, you know, the deaths that are happening on a regular basis. I think there was a period between three weeks um, where every weekend at least 10 people were being killed you all don't hear that very much over here. And, and so this project in itself 
we feel extremely proud of it because, again, we're here at Dartmouth being able to speak to you all about it, um, who don't regularly have that information. And so the reason we want to do that is because we think it's important, especially for, like, let's say, a community like this, where so many students are going to school to become senators, lawmakers, or, or movers and shakers. Um, you are the people who are going to be making a difference, let's say, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, five years from now. And so the artwork itself um, is that form where we say, look, we have artwork. Would you like to display it? And then once they understand that, yes, it is stating something, and we are um, trying to actually have a point to it, um, it becomes more, of a, a more important than anything else. So yeah, I think, I think you know, art has different forms, and, and I think it speaks more to people than um, you know, even words, because you can look at a, at a lot of these pictures and not understand because they're in Spanish, but you can get the gist of what they're saying. So I think, yeah, art is very important in that sense where it can make a difference. Um, thanks for this great presentation. I wanted to go back to uh, the comments that you made, Sandra, close to the beginning, talking about the similarities and differences between Juarez and El Paso. Mm -hmm. And one of the big points you made was the prevalence of law enforcement in El Paso indicating that that was the reason that El Paso could be considered the second safest city in the United States. If we follow that logic, then we would think that increased law enforcement in Mexico would help keep Mexicans safer. But in fact, the opposite has been the case since Calderon militarized the war against drugs. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if you could talk about that direct, uh, maybe contradiction, in, in implications of what governments and law enforcement bodies should or could do with different socioeconomic contexts? Okay. Well, what I can say is that in Mexico, going to what Richard said earlier, there is a culture of corruption, you know? And so the police makes, you know, their salaries are so low that they really couldn't survive on their salaries alone. So they have to go out, you know, and be corrupt. I mean, now I'm not saying all of them are. I'm sure there's a couple or more than a couple. But um, so, you know, and like I said earlier, you know, Juarenses feel like they contributed because of this culture of corruption. And then even though they fed it, at the same time, they don't have no respect for any form of authority. And then, um, like I said, Former Mayor uh, Reyes Ferriz of Ciudad Juarez, uh, he, when he came into office, he fired one third of the police and they all joined the cartels. And so you're bringing in federales from these little towns, they're not tr properly trained. Um, they come and Ciudad Juarez was a very rich city before all of this. Uh, and so, you know, they come, they see all this money, they're not paid very well, so they're tempted to fall into the a system of corruption. Then they bring the military, who are teenagers, that are being recruited from villages from southern Mexico. Again, they see all this money, they see all the bling, you know, and, and you know, they fall victim to it. And, and so it's very hard, um, they don't have I mean, the entire government, there's the corruption, you know? And so it's, it's, it's very hard. People, people do, citizens do not believe in their own government. You don't trust your own government, you know? So how can you guys work together to defeat this anyways, you know? I don't know if I answered your question, but that's my perception. What used to go on in Colombia? Can you repeat? Yeah. Can you repeat? There seems to be a lot of similarity to the situation in Colombia about 10 to 15 years ago to what's going on in Mexico right now. And there's even been talks about initiating Plan Colombia in Mexico. Um, to what extent do you feel like that would work? And there's arguments to how, you know, how well it has worked in Colombia. The violence is there. There's definitely less violence, but people could uh, people still say there's a lot of corruption still going on in Colombia. So I guess where do you see that going and what is the feeling in Mexico to this potential plan?
plan in Mexico? I'm not an expert on that. Um, I do know that the what they did in Colombia worked, you know, but it's coming back. So it, you know, it was it was a short term solution. If they were to Im implement something like that in in Mexico, I think. I don't know, I think a revolution would happen because the entire s system is so corrupt that, you know, I mean, how can you go about it? I don't know. I'm not an expert on that, but um, I don't know. Do you have anything to say? I mean, it's difficult to say only because um, what works in one country may not work in another. Um, I think the, the, the thing that would make it most difficult is the government itself and its participation in the cartels and in the drug violence. Um, a lot of them, of course, are hiding from the fact that you know, uh, they, they don't want to be affiliated themselves with cartels, but they are. They, you know, they'll take money, they'll do whatever. So uh, the corruption, it's, it's, it's to the point where you can look at somebody and say, yes, okay, you're, you're a senator of our state, I'm sorry, you're a senator of our state, but they could be taking from the cartel. and so their opinions and, and what they're trying to do to change the laws may not reflect what's for the better of the community. So um, we're not experts in that sense, uh, but, but it is, it's a difficult question. It, it really is because, again, it, it stems from, you know, the government down to the cu community members in, in, the, in Juarez itself. Um, and, and actually, that's part of our project, and that's one of the things I say all the time is that we say be the change. Be the change that you want to see in the world, which is uh, what Gandhi said. But you know, it, it, in some of these posters, it's uh, descriptive where, you know, just like this one, one person, sure, may not be able to do a whole lot, but you get a community together. That community gets another community. That community, community, and it builds. And so eventually it becomes where it's an entire group that's saying, we don't want this anymore. We don't, we don't want this violence. We don't want to live this way anymore. Um, and I think maybe eventually the violence could get to that point where the, the citizens themselves will say no more. You know, I mean, in some of the video, you can see how angry some of those people have become because, I mean, Juarez used to be at nighttime a vibrant place, a, an extremely vibrant place. But now you go about 5 p.m. when the sun's going down, 6 p.m., and it's, it's, it's like a, a ghost, ghost town. town. It's a ghost town, mostly because people are afraid to even walk outside because they don't want to even be around an accidental shooting. You know, I mean, it, it's gotten to the point where, you know, Sandra and I used to go and have lunch all the time or, you know, go have some drinks and come back, you know, during the day. But I honestly wouldn't think about that anymore. And a lot of people from the American side wouldn't do that either. So, you know, it, it's really hindering a lot of what they're able to do in terms of progress, um, school, education, even economic, social status. Um, it, it really does hinder a lot of what they're doing. So, um, again, you know, how, how do you go from taking a mass of, let's say, you know, their entire population and making it so that all of them are in agreeing that they want to change. Um, that is the difficult part. I think we're done now. Do we, have, do we still have time? Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm from McAllen in the Rio Grande Valley. I was born and raised there. And I have to say, just just since I've been at school over the last three years, it's been incredible. Not as concentrated and bad as in Juarez, but I mean, just northern Mexico at large. I know exactly what you're saying. All my relatives, my friends would all go over kind of at nighttime and come back, you know. All of that is gone just within a half generation. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you were also talking about the apathy, I think, in El Paso. Mm -hmm. And it's almost, I think, you know, I was raised on the American side of the border. It's almost apathy combined with a feeling of helplessness, maybe just really not sure what to do. Yeah. And I was just wondering whether you could maybe elaborate a little bit more. You said you had an upcoming project. Um, I was wondering a little bit more if you had any details about that, what you were envisioning for that. Well, it's going to be uh, it's going to be another graphic design exhibit. And um, like I said, we're going to uh, the, the topic is going to be perspectives. And we're opening it to inter international. And so we really don't have details. But if you go to our website and stay in touch, you can read up. So uh, is that it? Are we done? Yes? OK. Well, thank you very much. Oh, who, who, yeah, where, yeah. where? 
If not in Juarez, have any of the images been picked up in other uh, Mexican publications, perhaps nationally or based out of Mexico City? Have there, have there been any images that have seemed more resonant uh, than others uh, for uh, viewers potentially on one side of the border or the other? Are you saying which posters stand out the most well, to people? Well, I mean, uh, have, have there been any, for example, maybe that have been more resonant or that have been picked up uh, in, uh, in journalistic circles in Mexico or published, if not in Juarez, because you said they weren't responsive, have some sort of entered into uh, publication elsewhere in Mexico or that you've received stronger comment on? No. And, um, the exhibit we have we have different um, ah, we have we have different prints and so there's 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 a set that's there's, we have two sets we have a set that's traveling here in the states and we have a set that's traveling in Mexico and um, the way it's been we've been able to get it to be shown in Mexico is through the university system because they are autonomous, the Universidad Autónoma de Zaguar. So that's the only way we've been doing because um, the cartels have actually respected the universities. Any person can honestly feel safe in the for some reason. They, they've decided they don't want to mess with the universities. And so that's the only space where we can actually show the exhibit and feel safe, you know? Um, so when they do show it, they really don't call the press. It's more an internal, it's more for the students, it's not for the community. So no, we, we haven't been getting a lot. Now here in the States we have, not just El Paso, but in Texas and you know, online uh, news magazine, art magazines and stuff like that. Yes. What is the connection between all of this and the feminist sides? Are they still going on? Has it become less? Has it become more? Is there any connection? Um, the femini the uh, femicides um, are still happening. There's still a lot of women who are missing, uh, except that now the attention is on the cartels. And so the media stopped covering it. I don't know if you noticed one of the posters, you know, said it, it's still a cover up. Um, they're still happening except that the, the level of impunity, you know, um, has gone, I mean, it's gone to the point where people, the government is not going to investigate these crimes, you know, and so anybody, literally any man or person can go and kill a woman, disappear her, rape her, do whatever, dump her in the middle of the desert, make it look cartel style, and so now it becomes a crime, you know, related to the drug war and not necessarily femicide, you know? And so if you ask, if you ask the mayor, he's going to tell you that all those crimes have been solved, that the state police has figured it out, and that the people who are responsible for it are already behind bars. And we all know that's not the case. Um, a lot of women are now being recruited by the cartels. Um, so that, you know, you, hear, you, you watch the news and you see, you know, Maria so-and-so was shot, blah, blah, blah. You know, whether they're really cartel members or they're just victims, you know, we, we really don't know because most of the crimes are not investigated. So I'm sure there's still a lot of women out there missing. Yeah, I, I was thinking that that whole culture of impunity started with the murders of the women and where nobody spoke up, nobody did anything, everybody looked the other way, and now it's spiraled totally into the mm -hmm. culture at large, right? But I mean, the feminist side started how many years ago? 15 years ago? Yeah, 15 years ago. In the 90s. Have you all heard about the, the femicides? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, I mean, you know, these, these they were picking up grave sites, 300 women or more, um, you know, in some pit areas, uh, men and women, uh, but, but a lot of them mostly women. And, um, you know, it was extremely bad back in 1990s where it was suggested that if you were to go to Juarez that you wouldn't go by yourself because somebody could take you and, and there was a problem then. Um, and, and, and you're right, I think, I think maybe that has become um, something that started it or at least progressed into what it is now. And, and um, you know, hopefully, again, the, it's so bad that, you know, I mean, 
we were discussing this earlier, but um, they actually are building uh, bombs now. Um, I don't know if any of you heard over last, was it last summer? I think it was last summer at some point. But the cartels had a gentleman dressed as an ambulance, uh, a medical assistant. And um, he was laying down, and there was some ambulance, uh, ER persons, um, um, agents okay. as well, policemen, um, who were all trying to help this person. Well, there was a camera crew there as well. About a minute into the video, 45 seconds, this person blows up. So essentially, they strapped a bomb onto this person to, to either kill whoever was helping him or help or, or dis destroy whatever was around. Um, and so now, um, it, it's, it's, it's gotten to that point where it's so violent that they're thinking of doing things like this now. I mean, you know, the average, aver it, it's gotten to the point where now they're, they're done with cutting heads off of people and hanging them on bridges. Now they're, they're actually creating bombs and they're blowing up people. Two weeks ago, I believe the American uh, government declared uh, the cartels to be terrorists, um, only recently. So they're, they're starting to think about you know, what they're doing. They're, they're starting to be, they're essentially, I, I think what's happening now is that, you know, it, it's, it's the battle between the two and, you know, one of them's trying to up the other. And so now it's, it's becoming a war zone, essentially. I mean, it, it, it isn't like on a regular basis that they'll have car bombs going on all the time. But there was a point where three weeks a month, every weekend there was five, 10 deaths uh, related to the cartel violence and bomb, threats. Um, and bomb threats as well so it has increased and it has gotten extremely violent yeah definitely yeah. Mm -hmm. I just have a quick question. all right i have a quick question too sorry uh i want to know you guys originally started the whole thing for uh to like show the perspective of people who live there that was like a point of art but it's also to bring attention and so mm -hmm. now that you're kind of like putting in this like second part to the project. I want to know if you guys ever thought of using the actual images of the crimes and atrocities themselves to bring more attention to this, since, uh, I mean, there is like a so much censorship here in the US about what happened, since none of us ever hear about this, like about ha heads hanging off of bridges or people blowing up or, uh, you know, also like in uh, Juarez itself, since uh, there is so much fear and no one is would be brave enough to, show what's going on to the wider world? I or wouldn't show dead bodies and heads and this and that out of respect for the families of the victims. Um, I don't think you need to be so graphic, you know. I think you can give a message without having to sh show you, it. You're talking about you know? the actual violence itself or the posters or to, to, to create that awareness? Oh, like, well, so in uh, other past movements like in, uh, you know, in El Salvador when there was the revolution or in Nicaragua or other places, like the members of the families themselves who've had, who had like murdered uh, family members would carry pictures of them to show like the personal, you know, right. violence to this person and the connection and the atrocity and everything oh. that's around it. You know, like it's not just, mm -hmm. it's to bring awareness. It's not necessarily to make, you know, I guess uh, an example of said person. It's to show that this is what's happening right now you know, just south of this border, just five feet away from this fence. Mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. I just, I well, I think it's kind of interesting. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, how many of you all before this lecture even heard a lot of this? Oh. Okay. So a good majority of wow. people. <laughs> um, it, it's funny because when we go anywhere further than the southwest, that, that deteriorates a lot um, because, you know, I mean, People in the Northeast have different news. They have different issues, you know, that they're all concentrating on. What we're trying to do as an organization is do exactly that, bring the artwork to different places so that we can create that awareness. Um, because our main goal is to focus on making those donations and creating that awareness. Uh, because we do want to help these people. I mean, that's, that's essentially why we're in this, involved in this project. So we also do ask people who are like, like you all here today you know, to talk about it, you know, go outside, look at some of the posters, discuss it among yourselves, you know, because eventually you'll be able to take this and talk to somebody else about it. And that person may be able to take somebody else and talk to them about it. Um, social media today is just so huge that we have over 900 followers on our Facebook site. Um, and, and because of that, we feel that it is getting out there and, and it's creating more awareness. 
Um, but then again, we do also ask that you know, people like you all here help us out with that. Because essentially, it's just Sandra and I, you know, essentially. Mm. And um, when I was when we were organizing the first show, I thought it was I thought it would have been a good idea to actually interview people, get their stories, and actually have them play as people um, were walking the show. And so I made I had to go to Juarez. I made all these arrangements, you know, to do all these things. And I was going to have twelve stories. <coughs> of people who have been victims of the violence. And once I got there, they all backed out. Even though their faces weren't gonna be shown. Even though we, we told them we would manipulate the voice. You know, um, they said, never mind. How do I know you're not part of the cartels? How do I know they're not gonna come after me? And some of them already had, had already migrated to the US. They're already living in El Paso and they still had that fear. So, you know, for us to, to actually put a face to the violence, it's, if, if that's what you were trying to uh, ask, um, it's kind of hard because fear does overshadow everything. <coughs> yes. I just had a uh, question about um, that. Can you do the mic? I just had a, a question about um, uh, if there were conversations between you and other artists about, uh, you know, why posters? Um, and a particular, uh, I noticed just through the videos and stuff, they all seem to be a kind of uniformed size and, and shape. If there were like certain decisions about why that, you know, why you didn't pursue something more like, you know, lithography or, um, you know, other forms of, of uh, post art making. And if there's been other kind of collaborations with other artists on both sides of the, of the border pursuing other types of artistic strategies. Um, when I did invite uh, my friends and colleagues to participate, I told them that it needed to be a poster and it could be any size, it could be any medium. I think the poster with the fish is actually a 3D uh, poster. Um, they're all different sizes. We just resize them so that they look the same. Um, we actually had a poster that was interactive. Uh, they mailed us the, the board and it was numbered like a puzzle and then they sent us the pieces and so during the reception people could get a piece, see the number and glue it and by the end of the night the poster was formed. You know, and so we did have that. Um, we did get a lot of uh, painters and musicians and poets asking to be part of the exhibit but we wanted to keep it graphic design and the reason is because I'm a graphic designer and that's what I know. I mean, and because I was going to be the curator, you know, and so I couldn't, uh, I wasn't about to go and, ju and judge a painting or a sculpture when, when that's not my, when that's not my, my, my expertise. And so, um, and also, the re even though, uh, repro for reproduction purposes, and because like I said earlier, it was only going to be a one at show, we never thought it was going to be traveling and stuff. Um, we wanted to, uh, we asked the, the designers to print them for us, and so we didn't want it to be an expense for them, you know? And so that's why most of them did digital art. A few of them did screen printings, uh, you know. This one guy actually hand did the entire illustration. So yeah, um, there, like I said, we've gotten calls from artists, you know, like the Mujeres de la Tierra group. You know, they were really into it. They had all these really interesting paintings. And even though they weren't all talking about the violence, they they create they did it, this event. We 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 came. We displayed the artwork. They did a fundraiser, and all of the proceeds went to a piece of art. You know, um, music involved. There was poetry reading. Um, it was in general just an artistic show. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, yes, yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> so are 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 we still good? Are we? We're done. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, I can answer any questions. We can answer any questions in the back. And thank you all for coming.